There is a distinct connection between racism and trauma. Research has proven that repeated incidents of racism can have a physical and mental effect on people from diverse backgrounds. Here is a webinar presented by Kevin P. Henry on the topic. To get started here, um, my background, as, as Levi pointed out, I started out in diversity when there was just the D. And it was just diversity. It was this new idea because before that it was minority affairs or it was affirmative action or any number of things that really didn't speak to the breadth of diversity and, and what that's all about. And, and one of my definitions of diversity is that none of us have the same DNA. You know, we're all unique individuals with different lived experiences, different ways of looking at the world. And that's something to remember as we're working with people in a crisis situation or in a mental health situation, because it's very easy to, to fall into uh, looking at things uh, through our own lens, you know, doing, thinking people should do the things uh, the way we should do, you know, things like that. So it's a constant kind of uh, self-check that we have to go through as, as we proceed. And we also in the process of, especially for me in the last three years, I learn about myself as well. I learn about my own biases and I learn about my own uh, things that I maybe need to work on by interacting with other people. So as I said, I get a lot of gifts in this job and I really appreciate them. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to advance. I was advancing the slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, I don't know what I did, but it worked. Okay, um, at VOA, one of the things I really like about VOA is, is again, we talked about kind of the, the range of um, programs that we have. You know, there, there's some real basics to, to mental health and, and working with people in crisis and things like that. But there's, there's different layers. There's deeper layers to people, uh, again, based on their, their ethnicity or their sexual orientation or their lived experience. And so... VOA, as you can see, has uh, addressed that by having uh, separate uh, places for people to go and spaces for people to go where they can talk to someone with a similar or uh, the same background. And that's so important because I was thinking one time, uh, this was about maybe 10 years ago, and I had to, um, I had to go see a therapist, psychiatrist, actually. And I went only for a couple of sessions and it wasn't like I had any real major issue. The issue really um, involved having too many people living in my house. Okay. And not appreciating me. So I want, rather than explode, I wanted to, to kind of get some tips and advice on how to deal with the situation. But as this um, <clears throat> older Caucasian man with the silver hair and all the degrees on the wall was talking to me i'm thinking okay i'm talking about something he's doing a real good job at directing me through this situation but if i start talking about racism or what it's like to be a black man and you know uh, living in seattle or any number of experiences i'm thinking this guy wouldn't even know where to start so it just kind of emphasizes the fact that when people are talking to counselors and, and they're in crisis and they have that common ground that they can share it can just make that session even more uh effective. And I have to say as well, in, in my time at VOA, as well as Sound Mental Health, there were a lot of white therapists, counselors who were very open to just learning about people's backgrounds. So that when, you know, if you're a white MS, MSW graduate from Iowa, and all of a sudden there's a, you know, black man in crisis in your office, uh, because of the George Floyd murder, uh, the more insight that you can have into what that might, what that man might be experiencing, uh, the better. So just wanted to uh, highlight some of the VOA programs. So um, another thing, uh, as I said, that I've learned, I, and I love this saying, uh, change the question from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. I think we live in a society where we rely on data so much, you know, well, two out of four people are assaulted who live in urban centers or things like that. But the data doesn't say it all, because um, <clears throat> on the third bullet there, I had in parentheses about law enforcement. And I, I worked a lot with law enforcement over the year, try, trying to build 
relationships between law enforcement and the community. And a lot of times people would would kind of want to debate the fact that maybe law officers uh, uh, have a tendency to stop people of color more than white drivers, for instance. And then they cite the data and they cite the data uh, saying, well, you know, according in, in Minneapolis, out of 10 percent of the arrests, it was only 10 percent of the arrests were people of color. But that but what the data doesn't reveal is all of the, the traffic stops where there was uh, intimidation, where there was harassment, where there were undue reasons or, or not a good reason to even stop the person in the first place. So it's very important, again, not to just put people in a box and label them as being, oh, well, they're oversensitive or they're just one of those woke people that complain about everything. You know, again, a person's individual lived experience really shape who they are. And it's just important to really remember that. And you can take two people, <clears throat> for instance, you can take two people who maybe are of the same race, but grew up in a completely different environment. Uh, somebody who maybe grew up in an upper economic um, uh, system or, or class, and then somebody who may be of the same race grew up in poverty. They're going to have two very distinctly different uh, lived experiences. Some of the signs and, and symptoms of trauma, and I'm sure this is very familiar to, to all of you, really, um, in young children and, and adolescents uh, are some of the things that can be misinterpreted uh, and not seen necessarily as trauma. And sometimes that could even relate to culture. Like for instance, um, and, I, and this is a very broad generalization, but uh, in certain cultures, like say in certain Asian cultures, you know, there's there might be shame associated with even going to see a counselor. Whereas I've grown up in environments, uh, even growing up near Hollywood, California, it was almost like a cool thing to be going to see your therapist so it was like hey my therapist told me you know that kind of thing so it's very important to uh remember that even something like um tantrums in young children there are some families where tantrums are completely accepted well he's just expressing himself in other places, a tantrum might be a sign of something that's deeply troubling the child. So again, it's important to not necessarily jump to conclusions, or it's also important to associate culture sometimes or lived experience with some of these behaviors and not just say, well, that person's just a delinquent. Let's deal with it that way. Yeah, and these are, I know, I apologize for some of the small print or all the verbiage here, but I just wanted to put this slide in because it really kind of highlights the effect on uh, the um, uh, the physical health of people, stress hormones, of high blood pressure, um, anxiety, uh, ulcers, things like that can be directly related to a person's environment or it can be directly related to um, maybe they're, uh, they're gay and they came out to their family and their family didn't like the fact that they were gay. So some of these things can really affect people and studies have even shown that sometimes it can invariably shorten someone's lifespan in, in the long run. So just something to remember Okay, just some of the other uh, factors that affect diverse populations. Um, domestic violence, for instance, is something that I remember when I was in Bellevue, <clears throat> there was, um, again, I worked with law enforcement and there were cases of em new immigrants to the area who were being arrested uh, because of DV calls. And what was happening is yeah, obviously there was an issue. Anytime there's domestic violence, there's a deeper issue going on there. But some of the immigrants from some of the countries were surprised that they were being arrested because in their country, it was okay to basically slap your spouse in public or something like that. So some of the things that can affect people's behavior is maybe where they came from, maybe maybe the laws where, where they uh, lived in another country the laws were different, sometimes stricter, sometimes way more lenient. 
mental illness could have been seen in a different light. Um, I know that right now, for instance, uh, there's certain segments of the population that will associate mental illness. I've seen this online quite a bit uh, with people of different sexual orientations. So when somebody's coming into a crisis situation, they might be dealing with, it could be substance abuse or depression or something like that that's leading them to call 988. But at the same time, they're also carrying the weight of other issues, homelessness, for instance, uh, not a place to live. They could be, I work a lot with sex uh, trafficking survivors. Emotional and sexual abuse can be also fueling that anxiety. By the way, I know that um, your check, I can't even see the chat. So if there's uh, something that somebody wants to say, or um, or we can also wait until the end of the presentation as well. I just wanted to make sure that if somebody wanted to say something or ask a question. So if you can check the chat and just let me know when that happens. I've been checking it. Um, okay. So far, we're good to go, Kevin. Okay. Rolling right along. Uh, yeah, here's some more stats. Um <clears throat> Uh, black adults, Native and Indigenous Americans uh, reporting higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. This other bullet here that says cultural incompetence, and that's something that's been getting, thankfully, more attention with how healthcare providers are not trained necessarily in DEIB or cultural competence. And so what's happening is that somebody's coming in for care, it could be mental care, it could be, this could be a primary provider, what have you. And the providers are actually doing things that uh, ultimately uh, are uh, considered offensive by certain people and actually wind up uh, dissuading someone from seeking further care or they're underdiagnosed. And I've even, even at Sound Mental Health, when I was there, we had some issues where we were doing some training with some of our receptionists because and we all have biases. Uh, but what was happening is that, you know, you're working for a mental health agency. So people are coming in highly agitated, acting out, having uh, all kinds of episodes right there in the lobby. But what we were noticing was that the receptionist was calling 911 a lot quicker if there was a person of color where it was happening. So some of those uh, situations can have a ripple effect in that the person maybe they're arrested or detained. They decide, I'm not going back there. They tell five or six other people in their family, don't bother going to that agency because they they profile you or they don't treat you appropriately or they weren't taking me seriously. That's a complaint that I've heard a lot from people of color is that they go in and there's even there was even a study done about how certain providers were feeling that people of color had a higher endurance for pain so that when it came to taking them seriously or prescribing even you know pain medication in certain circumstances that that wasn't happening because of some deeply embedded biases way in the the back of people's psyches so it's just something to remember that when somebody comes in or somebody calls on a crisis line they could have a preconceived idea of you and you're going well why is this person being so apprehensive or nervous or anxious or skeptical well, that can be coming from a lot of lived experience or prior episodes with racism. It's not, it, it wasn't with you, but they're carrying that into uh, to the interaction. Okay, race-based trauma. Um, again, this has uh, been associated with PTSD in a lot of cases uh, where uh, uh, again, people are affected uh, physically as well as emotionally, as well as mentally. And these are just some places that you can go. And I can provide this PowerPoint to, to anybody and also uh, a whole bunch of resources where you can actually check out some of these studies. Racism in the news. I always encourage people, as hard as it is, to watch the news because there's a tendency I've seen that if something's not happening locally, like this particular incident, this happened in Buffalo, where I believe it was 12 black people were gunned down and killed by a white supremacist. Um, it has, a, again, it has a ripple effect and it can affect the psychological safety of people um, all across the country. I mean, I remember even when this happened, I guess almost 20 years ago, um, the movie theater shooting 
where the guy comes in, people are ready to watch, or the movie had already started, and he, I, I don't know how many people were killed. And this is somebody with a mental illness. But for the first time in my life, right after that, and for several months, I, I always kind of sat next to the exit door because I thought, you know, there's no place really that is safe. It used to be that I think, especially for people of color or other, quote, minorities, you felt like, okay, if I'm in church, I'm safe. No, not anymore. Uh, I'm sending my kids to school. They're safe, right? Nothing happens at a school. Uh, not anymore, as we've seen. In this case, you had um, a supermarket in, um, in a black neighborhood, in a neighborhood of color. And when I was growing up, and there's still a tendency to feel this way, well, if I'm in my neighborhood around my comfort zone, I'm okay, I'm safe. It's when you venture out like to the suburbs, like when I was growing up in LA, it's like, well, don't stay here. Don't go to the suburbs because that's when that's where all the racist people are that left the city to get away from people like you. So I always felt safe in my own neighborhood. But in this case, this particular killer went to this store three weeks prior and cased the store and even told a white employee, you better not be here next Tuesday because just take my word, you don't want to be here, right? So he cased the place, went right into the black neighborhood uh, for the second time and just killed people, you know. And then, you've, of course, they found online there were all of these, you know, kind of supremacist, racist things that he was uh, all about. But again, it has that ripple effect. Intergenerational trauma can be reinforced and fueled because a lot of times the older generation will tell the younger generation, aha, uh -huh, see, this is it's still going on. This is what. Your grandfather experienced, your father experienced, your mother experienced, and now you're still experiencing it. Uh, this is another situation uh, with the LGBTQIA uh, plus nightclub shooter, and uh, they were sentenced and found. But it's important to remember this, especially as we approach Pride Month, which is in June, because every June there's there's um, it could be uh, murders. Uh, pride flags are ripped right off of people's, you know, um, front lawns, basically, or businesses. Uh, I know that in Spokane, Washington, about, I think I want to say about four years ago, there was a bomb discovered there uh, next to a pride parade. So the, the thing to remember, again, is that uh, things that maybe aren't happening in our community or in your neighborhood or, you know, where you work out, are happening other places, but still affecting not only the people who are calling you or your clients or your patients or what have you, but also your coworkers as well. And it's really important that within a workplace to acknowledge what's going on and just, it's not that you have to come up with a solution, but the worst thing I think that I've seen this happen with certain organizations is to not acknowledge it at all. Uh, a lot of times uh, executive directors or CEOs will send out an email and just say, we're acknowledging that this tragedy happened or this injustice happened and we're praying for everybody or, or whatever. And the other thing I always, what we did at Cell Mental Health, because I started working there right after George Floyd was murdered, is we had listening sessions. We had sharing circles. We had facilitated discussions. We had systems set up for our employees, many of whom who were of color, uh, for them to at least vent, to be able to say what was on their mind, because just holding it in, again, will further that trauma. And then, of course, the symptoms of, you know, anxiety, stress, stress hormones, all of that stuff can then come into play. Oh, yeah. One of my favorites. So I'm sure you've probably gone to workshops on microaggressions, heard the term. Um, microaggressions are like a lot of things. They come in all shapes and sizes, but they come in different ways. And some of it's more insidious. Some of it isn't, isn't direct, but it can still uh, cause trauma or intensify trauma. So in this case, currently DEI is under attack from certain sectors. I'm sure you probably have heard stories about what's going on in Florida, or, or I know Texas just recently kind of banned, or laid off a bunch of DEI people. And so the idea is that you kind of, we should all be colorblind and DEI is actually somehow reverse racism. And in this case, 
DEI is responsible for putting unqualified people in very important decision uh, positions, such as uh, flying a jet. And this particular interview came about, uh, and not to get political, but Charlie Kirk is a, a very hard right conservative, fine. But this interview, this was his response, really, after the door blew off the Boeing jet over Oregon recently. And of course, when that happens, it's like, who's responsible for this? You know, and so a bunch of fingers get pointed. And, and so somehow the subject went to, well, there's, you know, DEI hires are putting our lives uh, uh, at risk, basically. So as a pilot, I'm thinking, I know I'm qualified, but it still can have that effect of, okay, now I've got people potentially flying on my airliner who might think that I'm not the best qualified person to be here. And I was hired as, quote, really an affirmative action hire. So these are another way of, uh, it's more fuel to the fire, so to speak. The other thing I want to mention is that uh, we've had uh, mental health counselors who you're trying to help someone who's potentially suicidal and they decide, oh, you sound like you're black or, or whatever. And then they start hurling racial slurs at you while you're essentially trying to save their life. So um, I want to give a hats off to our VOA uh, health and wellness coordinator, uh, Amy. Uh, we have other uh, uh, staff members who are, are very good about creating spaces where people can um, vent and can talk and get that support that's needed because, you know, you have a job to do. So there's a certain amount of this abuse that you have to endure, of course, but you also need to feel like your staff or your coworkers have your back and that they acknowledge what you're going through. They can't necessarily change it even, but they're there for you. So that's something that I'm it's very proud of um, how people are reacting to that uh, at VOA and even at Sound Health when I was there. Um. I definitely want to put this in here because even during um, the George Floyd uh, murder, and then there were subsequent murders after that, that um, a lot of times, and I have a Asian uh, consultant that I work with sometimes, she said, hey, you know, Asians are kind of getting some of this too. You know, there was an increase in Asian hate, discrimination, and again, you know, English-speaking Asian adults, more likely than any other ethnic group to say, I'm not going outside. I'm not going certain places. And when and when it affects uh, people from just living their regular lives, and then you you put on top of that the COVID lockdowns, and then uh, I even know some Asian uh, friends of mine and coworkers that are getting stared at or glared at as if it's their fault that the that the virus uh, even existed in the first place. So again, that's another thing that can happen based on what's happening outside the walls of your organization. It could be something happening in New York can affect people have, uh, that live in Dallas. Yeah, and so what we've been doing at uh, VOA is a variety of things. Everybody's been very uh, creative and very uh, collaborative. Um, this painting is by uh, an artist. We will be displaying her art in uh, the VOA offices in beautiful Everett, Washington. And uh, also as part of our online gallery and what we're looking for, and we've got already several art pieces that we've um, brought in, are is art that can spark conversation and that can also provide context and lived experience. This, this particular artist is a local Seattle artist and a lot of her art reflects her family's journey, which included uh, time spent being interned in the 40s and where they are today. And just giving you that insight and that intergenerational trauma as well that can be a part of that journey. We also have a George Floyd committee. Uh, I'm the chair of that. We have a great staff of, uh, we've got a, about a group of eight. Uh, we spend a lot of time just putting out um, educational emails and videos and things that just, again, give people context. Because, you know, uh, if you're living, you grew up in a, on a farm in Iowa, there's a lot that you aren't going to be exposed to. And it only really enriches your life on a personal level, but also it, I think, just makes us stronger at, uh, at the work that we do. 
We have VOA clubs online. And again, our health and wellness person uh, has been great at organizing these clubs, whether it be LGBTQIA or Hispanic, Latino, African-American, where people can talk, share information. We have webinars for our staff. We have podcasts. Um, and so we're always looking for ways because so much of our staff is, is virtual anyway. They're remote. So any way that we can keep people connected is so important and then also be able to uh, provide a deeper understanding of the diverse populations that we work with. Just some other things to um, think about. Remember, um, this happened, uh, the Pride Crosswalk was vandalized in Kirkland, Washington last year during Pride Month. And that was a rainbow cross uh, walk that was basically destroyed. They had to repaint it. Uh, there were people showing up at city council meetings that were making all kind of disparaging remarks about uh, minorities, people of color, uh, people from the gay community. Uh, trans people were getting a heavy, heavy truckload of hate, especially around uh, Pride Month. Uh, Texas University clears DEI offices. Again, uh, there are there's a movement to basically attack uh, DEI as being unnecessary, uh, unnecessary or a form of reverse racism. This incident uh, with the basketball team just happened, I believe, three weeks ago in Coeur d'Alene, where a group of women's basketball team was trying to walk from their hotel to a restaurant. And then there were several carloads and truckloads of people yelling uh, racial slurs at them. And so uh, I bring this up to, again, also uh, point out that sometimes people can have a regional bias and they can bring that into an interaction. I know, for instance, I have a regional bias Every time I have to go to Idaho, I've got to go to Montana, and invariably uh, I will see a Confederate flag or I see a racist bumper sticker or something like that that just reminds me, hmm, you're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. So uh, it's just important to remember that because it also explains sometimes why is this person I'm, why is my coworker triggered by a particular comment or or why is the person on the phone in crisis bringing up these things that happened six states away? It all has an effect on people and it all can increase trauma. Anything in the chat so far? No. Going once, going twice, going three times. Um, there was a comment oh. by Meryl. Meryl. That she um, indicated when you were talking about how you don't feel safe, um, you know, going to places that in the past we felt safe with i i e schools mm. um, or theaters um Merrill said makes us think about how to assess threat of violence in our work on the lines and mm -hmm. then she also mentioned the more recently dei caused the baltimore bridge collapse were some of the rumors that were going on so those two comments came from Merrill. thank you Merrill. yeah sure. it, it, <laughs> it's I mean, it's one of those things where, um, well, just recently, uh, I'll bring it up. I, I promise not to swear. This isn't going to be swearing. But I was in Montana. I have grandkids in Montana, so I've got to go. Montana is beautiful. Uh, I was there for five, usually, and this always happens. I was there for five days. I saw one other black person, and he really doesn't count because he was in the hotel. So he probably wasn't from there. Didn't see anybody else. Uh, my wife and I are sitting in a drive through coffee place. And, you know, we're sitting in the car. And so there's in front of us is a big, a big, huge truck. Okay, it's Montana, big, huge truck. And there's a huge bumper sticker that says uh, F Joe and his ho, H-O-E. So, so I knew that was Kamala Harris. And anytime you call a black woman a ho or any woman a ho for that matter, it's definitely definitely derogatory in, in various ways, but it just reminded me, okay, here I am. I don't think I'd see that in Everett. I don't think I'd see it in Seattle. So I start to make that association. And what reinforces that association, and, and I met some beautiful people in Montana. I'm not saying they're all like that by any means, is that this man felt safe enough and comfortable enough just to drive around like that. You know, so it wasn't it wasn't really the sentiment or the feeling 
uh, that he had uh, that definitely had racial overtones, but that he just felt, oh, yeah, I'm in my comfort zone. So, again, uh, say you're a crisis counselor in Monta rural Montana and a black person comes in and you're going, well, why is this person you know, looking around and a little bit agitated and an anxious or making assumptions about me? This this can be the reason, not that it's your fault. It's just more about being aware. Um, Native Americans, one of the things that I really appreciated about um, and I do appreciate about working at VOAWW is uh, I've learned so much in the last three years, really, about Native American culture, because even in all my work over the years, I just didn't have a lot of contact uh, with the tribes or, or with the history. And so, again, those microaggressions and, and just outright you know, racism can show up in different ways. It can show up in, in data, like the murder rate. You know, why is it, why is the murder rate like that? Why, why is it when uh, someone disappears and they're native or indigenous that they don't get the same news coverage, things like that? Uh, why is it that some of the sports teams have changed their names and others haven't and others will defend the Atlanta Braves or the Kansas City Chiefs or whatever is being, oh, it's just honoring people. Uh, I've heard various opinions about it, but personally, I feel that uh, if I see someone in the stands dressed up like a Native American who's not Native American and jumping up and down and and doing the tomahawk chop, I'm thinking, okay, so how is this this person's only association or interest in Native American culture is doing this every Sunday? you know, during NFL Sunday. Was there a comment about that? I, I thought I heard uh, a noise. Nope. Okay. I apologize. I muted myself. So somebody came into my office. Sorry. Did they knock first? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so again, at VOAWW, there's several things that we've done. I mentioned a few of them already. Lunch and learns are something that's very popular. Um, we have the director drop in. Levi is makes himself available on a very regular basis to drop in. And and the thing I like about the drop in too is that you know Levi can drop in and give us you know pertinent updates about things that we need to know. But it also uh, gives us a chance to get to know him on a more personal level. And it also uh, a lot of these different online forms that we have give us all an opportunity to learn about each other, learn about our backgrounds, see the similarities, see the differences, and clear up maybe assumptions. I mean, we, we're we influenced, our biases are fed sometimes by uh, things we see on TV or just lack of interaction with people. So if I'm talking to somebody uh, who's who lives on a reservation, I mean, I've been on a reservation once when I was 14, and I don't know anything about it. So when I'm hearing that from one of my coworkers in a in a more conversational, you know, relaxed setting, I just again I feel like it's enhancing me and it's also making me a better trainer really. The other thing uh, I wanted to say the last couple of um bullets is uh weaving trauma informed and DEIB um into the fabric and the branding of the organization so that it's not just this separate thing. It's like, oh, we've got to go to the annual diversity training now. You know, like it almost sounds like kind of like a, a flu shot or something, you know, check the box. And I don't think about that until next February or something is, and this can be fun. It's just ways of talking about it at meetings of uh, some of the language. I and mean, of course we have mission statements and strategic plans and all of that stuff. But just um, looking at it like uh, uh, a job that I used to have when I was in L.A., I had a job doing product placement and I worked for a company. And what I had to do is go through scripts, new scripts that were going to be produced, movies, TV shows. And the client might be Diet Coke or something like that. I would have to go through the script and determine where we could place a Diet Coke in the scene, basically. So if people are having lunch, oh, what are they drinking? They're drinking Diet Coke. Oh, there's a Diet Coke on the on the counter in the background. So think about it more as a lifestyle, not this separate thing like, oh, it's DEI time. You know, DEI is just part, it's like an ingredient when you're doing a stew. 
you know, if you eat the stew and you go, wait a minute, something's missing, you know, that could be the DI. It should be part of the recipe, basically. So um, the screen to the left there is just one of our uh, um, webinars that we did. You know, I'm there. The person to my, well, I guess it would be my left or right, is Michael Swan, an African-American uh, mental health counselor. And then a couple of slides over is Antonia uh, Ramos, and she's a Native American uh, mental health counselor. And we talked about microaggressions, and we talked about the toll that different forms of racism, microaggressions take on people. And then what we did is, this was a joint venture between us and the Snohomish County and AACP. So we invited people from their list as well as people from the VOA. And so that's also important is to get that feedback and that input and that interaction with people outside the walls of your organization as well. I think I'm closing in on like 45 minutes. These are just some resources. Um, and again, you can, um, I'll send the PowerPoint out. Um, I also, the last item there, I have a podcast, uh, which is a separate uh, project that I do, but uh, I'd say at least 50% of the topics have to do with what we've been talking about. And a lot of it has to do with interviewing sex trafficking survivors or interviewing immigrants to get their, their anecdotal uh, stories and to uh, learn more about how we can just... Uh, Help each other, support each other, and learn from each other. So let me see. I'm going to stop the share. And was that uh, about 45 minutes? Oh, you're muted. Perfectly timed, Kevin. I appreciate it. Okay. Were there any uh, questions or, or comments? Everybody's just mesmerized. Jeremiah. Hello. Uh, so I have a question and it's a, it's a half thought through question, but, uh, so I work primarily with, uh, young people, people age 25 and younger, uh, who provide service to other young people on one of our helplines. Uh, and one of the things that I've been, I've been trying to, to think about is, uh, some sort of, imp uh, implicit bias training or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think, uh, I think all of our volunteers are, are very good natured and I'd like to think that, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's no major problems there, but I know that, um, you know, things, things come up and we might not even be aware of them. Are you aware of any good resources for, particularly for young people, um, mm. that, that we could, uh, kind of integrate into our training or into kind of the, right. the culture of the organization? Well, sure. And I can send that out to you. There's three or four that come to mind, but one comes to mind is the Harvard, Harvard implicit bias test. And I don't know that any of them are necessarily geared toward younger people, but I could look into that because that's a very good question. Because for one thing, you know, if you're, if you're 15, 20 years old, you've, okay, you've got your biases and it's almost like, a, you know, filling up a glass but if you're 40 years old, you can have even more biases because you've got the extra 20 years for somebody to pour it into the glass. And that's sure. why it's sometimes interesting when you see older people, younger people, and, and oh, my grandfather, he's such a racist and he's such a, you know, whatever. So I will look that up. Uh, I will say that with biases is that what I like about these tests is that there's so much that gets buried in, in the brain, you know, even uh, I did a whole presentation on, on like colorism and microaggressions and just how, when you look up the word black, you know, um, for the most part, you know, you're black bald. It was a black day. It was, you know, it was, it's always negative. Whereas you look up white and you see, you know, purity, honesty, goodness, you know, even Jesus appears a lot more whiter than I think he looked. You know, so there's a lot of this that's kind of ingrained in our culture that's in the back of the brain. And sometimes it, you're not even aware of it until maybe you're in a conversation. And then I go, wow, did you hear what Jen just said? Where'd that come yeah. from? You know, and, and Jen might say, well, I don't really know where that came from. And then when she, you know, spends some time, yeah, my grandmother used to always say, because with Native Americans, when I was on a reservation at 14, I was a little nervous because the only thing I'd really heard about Native Americans, aside from seeing, you know, John Wayne Westerns, where that's not a good example, 
was that they had uh, were prone to alcoholism because my mom had a very good friend who was Native American and who died of alcoholism, basically. And that was my only impression. So when I was at the on the reservation, that was definitely I was even looking around like, OK, does everybody look like they're sober? You know, mm -hmm. so at 14, that was stuck in my head till it got wiped out later when I actually sure. learned more about the culture. Yeah. Thank no, you thank you for your, yeah. Thank you for your suggestion on that. I'll, I'll definitely check it out. I, uh, I think half the battle is, is knowing that these exist. So. Well, and, and being, and being okay with admitting it. I mean, I, you know, like I said, I have biases. I, my, my wife is um, from a small town in the country. I grew up in the big city. So she, every once in a while she would catch me, saying something like, well, why would anybody want to live on a farm? And, blah, 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 blah. you know, I had this <laughs> attitude and she said, oh, wait a minute. And I said, you're right. You know, that's my bias coming through is that I'm making assumptions that everybody in your hometown likes country music, which isn't true, among other things.